Several units of this course will be dedicated to the intersections of disability, including disability and race, disability and gender, and disability and sexuality. Your own work has explored some of these intersections, particularly those of disability and race and disability and sexuality. Can you say a bit about how these intersections have been relevant in your own life and how you have examined them in your work? It's so interesting when I started my genealogical work in my PhD, I thought I was doing a genealogy of disability and there might be some intersectional questions that come up. <laughs> and then I kind of realized about a year into the research that that's only the kind of question that a white settler could ask. The idea that there is anything about disability that isn't foundationally intersectional, I think is like a white supremacist notion that it is always intersectional. And I mean that both in terms of our identities, that we always have more than one identity and that we're not always only one thing. But more importantly, when we think about the kinds of structures of oppression and inequity that come together and reinforce each other that produce the thing that we now understand as disability, and in particular, the kinds of social, I think like inequitable life chances and social barriers and, and structures that make living with the disability and flourishing with the disability, particular kinds of disabled lives, hard for living and flourishing. And so I'll give you an example. I do a lot of work on disability generativity, but there's a really good argument to be made, which sort of says there's an equity in terms of which bodies experience disability and what kinds of disabilities, which bodies and which people in which social locations, what kinds of disabilities they end up with. So there's a incredibly strong correlation between experiencing any other form of oppression and experiencing disability. We're using here Statistics Canada <laughs> measurements of disability, which are problematic for all kinds of ways, including refusing to count people on reserves or refusing to count anybody who doesn't live independently. So no one in hospitals, no one in group homes, et cetera. But if you even look at those statistics, they'll tell you that, for example, an Indigenous woman has three times the national rate of disability. And it doesn't take, I think, a lot of sociological to imagination to imagine why this is the case, right? When we think about not having access in certain places to clean drinking water, and we think about effects of colonialism on poverty, and we think about effects on poverty on health, we think about the kinds of inquiries we've had on inequitable access to health care, people not getting the health care that they need. And there's just so many reasons why experiencing deep systemic oppression renders you much more likely to experience disability. And experiencing disability, of course, increases your likelihood of experiencing things like poverty and increase illness and, and health consequences. And so there's a way in which the oppression of disability is, has always been deeply interrelated with other forms of disability. And, and this is not only in the case Canadian, it becomes even more clear if we take a sort of global context and how global capitalism disables bodies and just exceedingly amounts, it just does so in countries not of the people who are primarily consuming the product. So in this case, we think about like the impairment of bodies is fundamentally intersectional with forces of disability and other forces of oppression, if we want to make that distinction for the sake of this argument. And it also works in the microworkings. It's not just in this large sense. So like in every way that disability is engaged with, I would say it's engaged in a way that is it's always intersectional, right? It's just in, in intersecting with whiteness most of the time when we think about our disability supports. So a good example is right when the Paralympics were coming in, it was largely about white injured soldiers and the kinds of injuries they had. Paralympic Games were created to cater to those, spinal cord injury, amputation, acquired visual impairment. But at the time for decades and decades and decades, we weren't seeing sports emerging for folks with congenital muscular dystrophy and cerebral palsy was decades later, folks with intellectual disabilities, some of the people who were putting forth, were mobilizing for and creating uh, this infrastructure for the parallel movement were also eugenicists and were fighting for the institutionalization of other quote unquote kinds of disabled people. And that was not only in terms of impairment, but also around a very racialized kind of characteristics and what kinds of impairments, what kinds of folks had. And so still to this day, privileged folks get particular kinds of impairments and non-privileged folks, which often in, in Canadian, very racist and colonial Canadian context means often racialized indigenous folks receive other kinds of impairments and the kinds of supports that the federal government gives, the kinds of sporting opportunities, all these things that are funded tend to be catered to the forms of injury and the forms of health concerns that white settler middle-class Canadians encounter. So I, I don't think it's possible to think about disability outside of an intersectional lens. Thank you. Can you say a bit about your own scholarship and how you've explored those intersections? Yeah, so 
in my PhD work, <laughs> it took me a while to figure out what it's about, but in many ways it ended up being about the ways that technologies of disability have been utilized in Canadian nation making and colonialism. We tend to think about when we do histories of disability, we tend to think about, oh, how have disabled people been treated by the state? And in this case, I'm really interested in the ways that how has the state's identification of the technologies around the treatment of the policies around the discourses around disability, how have those been used by the state in its racist colonial nation making project? And it's a very different kind of question. And it means that those of us who are white settlers who experience disability, even like for myself, I'm gender queer, non-binary and queer, but I still have the kinds of racial and settler privilege that make me legible to the state in very real ways. And so how am I then complicit in this sort of ongoing use of disability as a way of engaging with and governing and controlling populations that do not experience my privilege. And so one tool I've used for this is I talk about how we talk about the safety net and everyone wants to go back to the golden days of the safety net. And I talk about how social safety nets like disability funding and employment insurance have always worked as like nets in multiple ways. So they've worked to support particular people to sieve out other people. So to ensure that the rules ensure that certain people never receive those supports and funding and also to ensnare other folks. So when we think about the quote unquote golden age of social security, this is the height of indigenous children being taken by social workers into the welfare system. This is the height of eugenics in Canada and people being institutionalized. These social safety nets were also designed to ensnare particular people just as they were supporting others to live sort of in the community and, and financially viable lives. I'd say in contemporary times, my biggest projects have been with uh, Trisha McGuire Adams, who's an Anishinaabe scholar. We've worked on a, a couple projects, including with Miskwichi's and working with community to figure out what does disability mean from, in this case, a Cree context, and how do we engage with the kinds of ways that settler notions of, of disability and settler structures, disabling structures, have found their way within the reserve and within the kinds of supports and services people want, and how do they access movement cultures of meaning to them, as opposed to movement cultures that a colonial state might find <laughs> most meaningful. So that'd be an example, or I'm working with a range of scholars, uh, including critical race scholars, wide range of indigenous scholars, including a Mohawk scholar, Métis scholar, and a Anishinaabe scholar, to think about the ways that our current recreation system has been built on colonial and white supremacist and ableist kinds of rationalities and, and assumptions and structures, and how we can work with the people who run recreation in Canada to try and fundamentally change the way that these inequities are built into their organizations and programs. What would be an example of that, of how recreational programs are settler colonial? In yeah, larger? great example. So um, what we tend to do is there'll be an organization who decides that, hey, let's say we have a hiking and climbing in the mountains kind of organization. And they realize that almost 90% of the people who are, you know, their membership are white middle class folks, settlers. And so what they do is they'll create an equity policy. So I like to think of an equity policy as like a little pin that you wear on the outside of your body, right? And if I just put a pride pin on me, then suddenly um, all these people who are some, for some reason structurally absent are suddenly going to be present and it'll be safe for them. But of course, we're not asking why they're not present in the first place. And those reasons are baked into the, all the other policies, not the equity policies that's the add-on, but all the policies that we, we have right now that we sort of naturalize and imagine as neutral are actually foundationally created and were foundationally created sometimes explicitly for the exclusion of particular folks. So if you think about a lot of our national parks were created on, on confiscating land, like in the 1970s from indigenous communities. And so there were specific kinds of rules and regulations that ensured that Indigenous folks weren't coming in on these programs because they were trying to be displaced from that land actively at the time. And so some of the rules and regulations are indirect. They don't name particular folks, but they have the effect of ensuring that continued exclusion. A lot of those around, for example, financial, the requirement to pay particular amounts, pay park fees, <laughs> and who can afford to pay park fees. Other issues around it assume that like in order to access these programs, there's something that people are getting in their own car and driving to the mountains. There often aren't public transportation options to get to places where these things happen. And so the idea that like a disabled person who might not drive, that someone who doesn't own their own car, the chance of them being able to come to these spaces are incredibly low. And not to mention being able to afford tents and other kinds of equipment and bring them with you. 
Other kinds of barriers that might be built in include, I think, a kind of like ethic that is incredibly like fat phobic and um, sometimes even equipment that only comes in particular sizes or that's highly gendered. And so there's all kinds of ways that the sort of naturalized way that things happen and ensures that the vast majority of folks can't come, even though there's not a rule that says X person can't come. And so how do we actually look at those sort of assumptions? Not funding people's access to come to the space seems oh natural. We don't put money into that. But that, of course, means only the only people who are going to come are people who can afford to drive themselves and can have their own cars who can drive. Um, so that would be an example of how things just come to be baked into a, to an organization or a culture. <laughs>